Welcome back to part 4 of our Petscop analysis series. We've gone through the videos and we've analysed each of the characters, and now it's finally time for the climax of the show. Today on the Panopticon Theatre, we'll be covering overarching theories about what actually happened in Petscop. Before we hop into theories, I want to go over some smaller elements that are useful or interesting to mention, but haven't fit directly into theories, so I haven't had a spot to talk about yet. Mostly background elements that might or might not tie into things we mentioned before, or the theories we have coming up. I have two interpretations of the Counselor scene I want to present here. The first is simply that the scene didn't happen in real life and is being used to communicate something to the intended player, likely a sense of therapeutic safety and offer of help. The questioning of the player's identity is particularly interesting to me, as it's possible that Reyna is using this to in some way identify the success of rebirthing, perhaps. The alternative interpretation is that this scene represents a time after Kerr's return from Marvin's capture. This is following specifically the transgender theory, but may also apply to the Paul is rebirthed Gary theory. At this point, Kerr is Paul, but is only just beginning to use that name. This is why the counselor asks if the name they have is correct. It's listed in the documentation as Kerry, but the counselor called for Kerry and they didn't come, because that's Paul, not Kerry. The reason for him being called in is probably that he seems to have some sort of injury, and likely has been acting differently since the incident. As Paul is still pretty young at this point, the counselor playing a game with him is likely a way for them to try and get some information about Paul's situation in a gentle manner. This is likely what led to Paul being removed from the family's guardianship in theories that involve that. Either way, it's important to still remember that this dialogue is written by Reyna. The text, at least to me, feels rather like it switches between the counselor speaking and Reyna speaking. I think it's more likely this scene never happened and it's a Reyna fabrication. Otherwise, it would have to be something Paul told Reyna about before the last version of the game, which maybe we don't know how close the cousins were, but from the sound of it, Paul doesn't remember Reyna that much, so I doubt they were close enough for Paul to be sharing stuff like that with him. Also, of course, Reyna was missing around this time anyway. Whilst we're on the topic of the counselor, there are four board games seen in the scene. Grave Robber is the one we see played. It's a bit complex to explain, but there are actual playable rules out there. I'll leave a link in the description. The digging up of graves is pretty interesting. We do see Reyna mention that photos are buried in graves, and that he may have dug up some graves himself. The gameplay also seems vaguely aligned with the door puzzle mechanic, as the player has to navigate potentially unseen obstacles, also rather like care upon a return home. Rotation obviously connects to the general ideas of rotation and perspectives throughout this series, probably why it's the only one upside down. There is a real board game called Rotation. It's like a wheel maze connect four sort of thing. Accident likewise connects to the theme of accidents, and the symbol on it looks rather like this from outside Tool's room, possibly a simplified visual of a car accident. Another interpretation that I like a little better is that the pieces represent care, as Carrie and Paul. They are the right colours for that after all. They're together at first to the same person, then Paul splits away from Carrie. There's more red because Paul has been, well Paul, longer than he was Carrie. The word accident doesn't connect to this idea that much, but it's still interesting. There's not much to be said about checkers, I don't think, though I'm sure you could find a way to read into it. There are a couple of loading screens in the game that might be interesting to mention. Most of them need to be brightened to see properly. I'll only discuss the ones I have something to say about, but there are others. This one is potentially the school basement stairway. The door being down and to the right ties in with the initial note about becoming the Shadow Monster Man. This one clearly shows the party hat piece, which again reinforces that this piece is perhaps more important than the others, which again ties into our theory from the previous video about them representing Lena, especially as they are the same shape. This one is very unclear, but it looks a little bit like a chair in front of a piano. This other one also shows a piano, but with a PS1 controller surrounded by a red ring. It's popularly assumed that these shapes in the ghost rooms are pianos, and it's possible this connects to the themes of music throughout and also the Needles piano. This one seems to show a revolving door in a room with the even care colour scheme. This door doesn't seem to exist within the game, but this image does seem to connect with the ideas of rotation, and perhaps also multiple worlds. It also may be referencing the closed door puzzle. This one seems to be a real life photo of crayons on a sofa, and they seem to be the same brand as the ones we see in the game, like here when Paul pushes them into the pit under the school. They seem to be tied to care. Here are the other images, though I don't have much to comment about them. They show Tiara slash Belle's face, the quitter's room from above, grass in the new maker plane, the girl photo from the school, Marvin's head in the needle's piano, the dirt pillar under Randus and Wavy's room, Marvin's head from the side, the Garolina logo, 
and the garage at the end. I've sort of skimmed over it a bit, but Garolina is a confusing element. It's the company or publisher associated with Petscop, as seen in the splash screens. It's typically assumed to be a compound of Garage and Lena, and seeing as we do see a garage with a computer in it, it kind of makes sense, but it's unclear exactly who Garolina is. It could be a single individual, perhaps just a name Rena came up with to publish the game under, or a group of people involved in Petscop's creation. As Lena is often referred to as Boss, she could possibly be connected as a part of this company, heading it in some way, though how or why are unclear. Perhaps as well this company is associated with the family as a whole. I've seen people suggest Jill or even Anna are a part of it in some way or another, likely because the garage is indeed in Anna's house. I think this specific element is difficult because your interpretation of it relies almost entirely on which theories you believe. Either way, all we really know about it is its name and that it's associated with Petscop. What do you think the story behind Garolina is? The five words written on a chalkboard is still something of an unsolved mystery. Some people interpret it to be the do you remember being born line, however, looking at the text, those words don't seem to line up super well. The writing on this paper in Petscop 2 is often assumed to be the same text, and they do look pretty similar, although why one would be censored and not the other is unclear. It's likely these words are connected to care, as all the caskets are. As they're located in the school, it's possible they were written by her during her time there. The fact that they're in the lower corner of the chalkboard supports this, as she was a child, and that's a likely height for her to be writing at. An adult would likely have written it higher up, nearer to eye height. There are many different interpretations of this text. The first line, many people see as either Garolina or Care A. The metal section looks potentially like is a or isn't. The last line could be present or monster or, well, a lot of things. I think Care A is a present, is a sensible combination of those, but it's really very hard to tell what it could be. Can you see other words in there? Some smaller points. The early sprites seen in 18 are in black and white, and look much like the design of the Tiara character, suggesting that Tiara's sprite may be from an earlier version of the game. The handwriting style of the pet's menu names is somewhat similar to the style of the red tool text and the do you remember being born sign, suggesting they may have been written by the same person. The area code seen very briefly in Petscop 16 before it's censored is for the Southwest Connecticut area. This might mean that the primary locations of the series, at least the school, may be in this region. Throughout this section of video, I will attempt to present as many of the facts for the major theories surrounding Petscop as possible, without too much bias, though I will conclude with my own personal opinions. More than ever with this particular video, I want to make it clear that your mileage may vary, and you're free to have your own opinions on the subjective truth of Petscop. Some elements of theories contradict each other, some ignore certain elements, others stretch and twist the presented story to fit their ideas. I want to present these theories without trying to objectively say which one is correct, because Petscop is one of those pieces of media where it's almost impossible to say that one interpretation is in fact objectively correct. Also, some of these theories originate from earlier in Petscop's lifespan, when certain reveals had yet to come to light. Often these were popular theories prior to these reveals, and people remained very attached to them. And as such, there are cases where later information is either ignored or stretched to fit theories that no longer quite work. I'll nonetheless present these theories, as they still remain very popular ideas. Please keep in mind these points as we go ahead. Are you right or left-handed? If we sit at opposite sides of a square table, your right is my left. But if you sit to my left at this table, your right becomes my backwards. And what of a circular table? If we all sit around it, all our rights and lefts don't line up at all. And how many sides has a circle? How many people can sit around? How many different lefts and rights are there? This is the concept of the idea of rotational perspectives. What is true from one person's angle is not necessarily true from another angle. Such is what the counselor mentions within their scene. My right is actually your left. Rotations, mirrors, and directions are a recurring theme in Petscop, and it makes up a large portion of the overall discussion of Petscop theorizing. We don't have time to discuss every single instance of it appearing, so I'd highly recommend checking out Mr. Seat's Petscop rotation theory for a good discussion on the general idea. I'll link it in the description. Why are we discussing all this? Well, it's an important prerequisite for understanding the rotation theory. The basis of this theory is the idea that whatever happened at the windmill caused Lena and the windmill to rotate to a different perspective reality or timeline. Lena and the windmill continue to exist, but can only be seen via certain perspectives or by certain people, the specifics of which vary based on the individual takes of this theory. Thus, Marvin continues to believe she exists, but to much of the rest of the world, she is dead. His idea of rebirthing could therefore be perhaps rotating Lena back into another body. 
This could also explain an alternative take on the theory that Paul and Kara are the same. They are variations of each other from different timelines that swapped in rotation. In Petscop 19, a message on the menu screen reads, there are no changes, only replacements. The open door puzzle is a great example of this. The door was open in the demos, but in the actual game it was closed. Paul essentially had to use knowledge of the quote unquote other world or other timeline, the demo timeline, to navigate the room. Can you see the room? Not everyone can. The Grave Robber game is another great example of this theory in motion. Each player has to navigate their own world whilst working around unseen obstacles from another world, their opponent's world. This is a fantastic visual representation of this whole concept. We see often multiple slightly variated versions of things, such as the two very slightly different versions of Even Care, one version which has been nicknamed Odd Care. Perhaps the world of Petscop is much like this, multiple very similar realities varying in priority that can affect each other in different ways. My personal opinion on this theory is that it began to evolve very early in the Petscop timeline, and supernatural elements were often used to cover up unexplained or strange things that later in the series were given a more mundane explanation. This theory still generally works, but if you've probably guessed from the way I've discussed theories before, I much prefer the more mundane explanations of Petscop, as I think it works with the themes of the story much better, and I think the story can be tied up without the need for a supernatural twist. This is a very popular theory, and I can certainly see where it comes from though. You're the new maker. You can turn Care NLM into Care A and close the loop. The basic premise of this theory is that Petscop represents a thematic loop. Things are repeating over again, and Paul needs to close the loop to stop the reoccurring trauma. This is often presented via things like the persistent mirroring, and particularly scenes like this, where Paul follows the exact path of a duplicate of him without realizing it, though notably the creator did say this particular moment was an error. Whether this involves literal time travel or just a thematic repetition, it's just based on personal interpretation. There are things that could hint towards time travel, such as this rotated clock scene. However, it's generally assumed to be more like trauma repeated across generations. The loop theory can be applied to and mixed with other more specific theories about occurrences in Petscop. As for my thoughts on it, I think there certainly is an element of thematic looping occurring in Petscop, but I don't personally think it's the core element of the series, nor is it really a full explanation for what's going on. It's an interesting element to reference though. Are you still sitting on a chair? Can you still look around the room? Is there still a room? This theory was primarily popularized by Game Theory, though unfortunately the Game Theory videos present a pretty warped view of the series, especially as they were largely made with incomplete information. However, this does not discount this theory entirely. Basically, this theory suggests that Petscop is, in some way, being used to train AIs. Proponents of this theory suggest a Darwinian algorithm, or generation-based algorithmic learning system, which to put it basically in the context of a game, involve running a large number of bot players, and those that get closest to succeeding are reproduced, and so on and so forth, until one is trained to beat the win condition. This is suggested to be seen in Petscop 17, where we see the various generations of seemingly randomly acting players, until one finally makes it out the door and we follow them. This successful one would be our next generation start point. I'd recommend watching the previous video in which I discussed the in-game characters of Tiara and Marvin if you haven't already, as I did already slightly discuss this concept. One interpretation of this theory is that Marvin in the game is an AI designed by Reyna based on Marvin's inputs, so that Reyna can use the AI to figure out secrets that real Marvin keeps, such as the location of Lena's potential grave. We already discussed Tiara as an AI, so I won't rehash that idea. It's worth noting that this level of highly sophisticated AI didn't really exist around the time the game would have been being developed. Reyna would have had to be some kind of incredible ubermenchian genius to figure out something like that, especially on his own. The series generally otherwise seems to stick with realistic technology, at least as far as I can see. Getting an AI to go out through a door through Duinian learning is one thing, but one that develops its own genuine personality and can answer non-programmed questions about a real person's actions is another thing entirely. It's something we don't even have today. Another take on this theory is that Reyna developed the game as an AI project in the first place. It's been suggested that it was developed to create AI versions of children, perhaps as for pets, perhaps as a therapy tool of some sort, or to keep records of the children in case something were to happen to them, either to rebirth them back into themselves, or perhaps as a historical record of them for their families, like those services that create social media bots based off a person's typing style. This might explain why the pet named Amber acts a little similarly to the tester named Amber, and why the pets seem to be occasionally referred to like people. There's also the mysterious Petscop discovery pages, on which we know there is a page called Your Child, is this Reyna setting up a service for people to enter their children in the game? This would also explain the controller inputs being used. 
child library rooms might also connect to this idea in some way as storage for the different AI children. It also may be of interest in the Tiara conundrum. Could Reyna's rebirthing attempt on Tiara be him trying to remold an AI state he already had, Bell, into a different one? We discussed it before, but to reiterate, this may be why her game had been running for 17.5 years. That was her AI running. That's why she was asked, are you still sitting on a chair? Can you still look around the room? Is there still a room? She isn't in a room. She's an AI, acting like a player. Again, this is something that's not possible on a technical level with today's technology. However, if we suspend our belief a little, I think this version of the theory is maybe a little more plausible. Finally on this theory, the AI theory in general may pose an interesting answer to the care saying Paul's dialogue from a year ago scene. If the game has been fed real life data to train AI, it's possible someone plugged that conversation into the game and the game is putting it out as dialogue, as conversation based AI often outputs exact or very similar sentences it's been fed before. Notice that Paul says the conversation is based on the conversation he had, not the exact conversation. Who would do this and why is still unknown, as it would be after Raina's death, but it is an interesting way to approach that particular mystery. We're going to help you together. Everyone is. This theory posits that the game of Petscop was initially designed as a therapy tool. There are several references in the game that could be interpreted to be related to therapy or therapeutic practices. There are some clear references to this, such as the counsellor scene. This scene, as well as reflecting a school counsellor, could also reflect a child therapist. These therapists often use different tactics to engage with children than with adults, such as playing a game with them to both gain their trust and analyse their responses to it, or saying things that might seem random or disjointed, but are used to judge the child's reaction to them. This could explain the weird, slightly stilted dialogue. It might also explain why they bring up swearing if care had been set there regarding their changed behaviour. Other elements reflect therapeutic concepts in a more abstract way. For example, the scene where Paul is pushing items down the hole outside the machine room. The items he pushes in are generally connected to Carrie, like the crayons we see multiple times. This might reflect the idea of distancing himself from Carrie or discarding parts of his previous life. The associations with music could also be a connection. A popular form of therapy, especially for children or people who are less responsive to regular types of therapy due to things such as learning disabilities, is music therapy. I've actually had the pleasure of working briefly alongside a music therapist myself at a previous workplace, and it's a really wonderful way to connect with clients who would otherwise struggle to communicate, and as a musician myself, of course I think it's an interesting concept. It involves using music and instruments to connect with the patient and using their responses to it to analyse issues they may be having, but also allow them to relax and open up via the medium of playful creation of sound, establishing a therapeutic relationship between therapist and client. It is particularly interesting in regards to Petscop, where the use of music seems to have implications beyond just sound. Some people interpret Marvin's connection with the school as him having once been a music teacher there, explaining why even though the school is abandoned, he has the knowledge of it to use it for whatever he's doing. Pianos show up frequently. The Needles piano is a major part of the story, and pianos can be seen in the loading screen image and probably in the ghost rooms. Background music in the game seems occasionally of interest even. I'd again have to recommend Mr. Seat's videos on the music of Petscop. So it's very fair to say that music is at the very least relevant. It's in this view that we should look at the rebirthing process, which clearly seems to involve music in some way, shape, or form. Paul is asked to play in the machine room, and his choice of music clearly affects the process, and Stravinsky's septet is associated with the tiara rebirthing. I've seen some suggestions that Garolina may not be a games company at all, and instead be some sort of therapeutic company or service. To connect with what we said earlier, games are used as therapeutic tools. It's Typically classic physical games like board games, but companies have created video games as therapy tools before. It's interesting in fact that we see some sort of Garolina office or computer room in the school. When asked about the school, Paul says you can't go back in time. This could mean that the school is in fact no longer a school, though it used to be, and now is owned by Garolina, a company associated with mental health tools. It also explains how Reyna was able to access a PlayStation dev kit that might be hard as a single developer, but a lot easier if he happened to work for a company that could get access to one. It also might explain why the game records each playthrough. It's meant to be played, then reviewed by a therapist, though other games of the time did record gameplay, so this isn't for certain. Of course, the website and the Your Child pages could very easily tie in with this theory, especially if this company was looking for clients. So, what theory do I personally prefer? Well, as I've mentioned before, I generally prefer the more mundane leaning theories for Petscop. Earlier in the series release timeline, a lot of theories leaned heavily on supernatural elements to make up for lack of information. 
as more videos came out and more things were figured out, I think a lot of the things people were trying to solve with supernatural explanations were solved instead with more terrestrial ones. Personally, I think Petscott reads so much better when it's read without supernatural theorising. This feels like the tragic story of a particular family and the things that happen to them seen through the eyes of their shared dramas. I think reading it as magic or supernatural happenings takes away from that a little bit. When you start introducing things like alternate universes or time travel, it takes away from that grounded tragedy that suffuses throughout Padscott. Some things can't be fully explained or understood by us, and that feels like part of the design of the series. The creator noted regarding a website that would have been part of the series that he decided not to include that element as it would provide too much information. Clearly, we aren't meant to know everything. It's also worth noting that we're seeing this story through two blurred lenses. One is that both our main information sources, those being Paul and Rayner, are unreliable narrators. Paul is restricted in what he says in the videos. He's keeping certain information away from the family, so thusly that information also never makes it to us. A lot of things also clearly happen off camera that we never really get told about and have no reason to be mentioned in the videos, so we just never get explanations for them. We don't know exactly what Paul and Belle found at Tool's coordinates, for example, or exactly why Paul was in a car. This is stuff that happened outside of our blinkered view, as all we see is the selected video recordings we're given. Rainer, for his part, is almost certainly dead, and the only information he can provide are the things he left behind in the game. He also doesn't seem to make much of an attempt to communicate those things in a particularly clear manner. He's providing a huge chunk of information in the story, as the series spends its entire course inside the game he made, but he's also speaking through layers that we can't easily pick apart. The second blurred lens is the fact that the people involved in the story start out with information we don't have and assume they don't need to give it to us because from an in-world perspective, they don't know or care that we're watching. What I mean by that is, let's use Jill as an example. Paul clearly knows who Jill is, and probably way more about how she's involved. Elle, who is where they're directed to, seems to probably also know who Jill is as Paul makes no attempt to explain, so he just doesn't explain. Which is great writing. Paul shouldn't just info dump about who someone is just because the audience doesn't know. There's no reason for him to sit there and explain who Jill is, but he knows the person he's speaking to already knows that. But we don't start out with that information. We aren't part of this family. We don't have the historical and personal context needed for elements like this to make sense to us. But they make sense to the people our narrators are directing their speech towards. So that is why we don't have certain points of information that feel like they should be important. The people involved already know it, so we're left to piece it together without that context. Because of these points, a lot of Petscop comes across as a little disjointed and confusing, which is where I think most of the more magical interpretations come from, a way to explain, without accepting, that we just don't know certain things. It's intentional, of course. As I said, we're not meant to know everything. We have a good go at piecing it all together, and a lot of it does actually make pretty clear sense when she spent the time to think about it, but that's where there are still elements that are distinctly unclear and unexplained. I do believe that everything in Petscop has a direct explanation, and personally, I do think everything can be justified without the need for magical or supernatural elements. It's just that we're missing the context for certain things. So for me, I like my Lena theory from the previous video, that she's alive but mostly no contact with the family, and that her and the windmill disappearances were more natural. I like the Paula's care theory, particularly the transgender variant, as personally I think it fits best with the themes and information we're given. I'm not 100% sold on it, but to me, Tiara being an AI makes the most sense with what we know, though there's parts of that theory I'm not super happy with. And I like to believe at the end that Paul and Belle got a happy ending in whatever form that takes for them. And I like to believe that Lena's involved somehow and they're making some sort of new family together. After months of digging, scouring, head scratching and confusion, we're finally here. I feel like I've watched every Petscop video on YouTube, even the ones in languages I don't actually speak, read every post on the Reddit, delved into just about every social media and wiki to put together all the different theories and evidence on Petscop that I could find. And was I successful? Did we finally have a solid answer to what happened in Petscop? Well, no, not really, and I don't think we ever will. Petscop at its core is a deeply interpretive piece of art. It's not meant to be fully 100% understood. There are common themes and concepts we can put together, questions we can answer, and thoughts we can turn into theories. But we're generally never going to have the whole entire story as the creator intended, unless he happens to decide to just explain it all one day. But I really hope he doesn't, because for me, the main appeal of Petscop, the thing I find so engrossing and intriguing about it, is the community that grew around it. Petscop was a perfect petri dish to grow a community of people that wanted to put their heads together, throw their evidence into the ring, and create theories together. Every place I stuck my eyes into to look for more ideas, I found people discussing, dissecting evidence together, and working out their own unique takes on the series. Even though Petscop may have faded a little from the public conscious, 
The bed of creativity and theorizing will always be there. For an analysis lover like me, what heaven that is to see. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone from these communities for their help in creating this video series. The creators of and contributors to the Petscop Comprehensive Progress document, the folks over at the Reddit, all the other YouTube video creators, and of course, everyone in the comments who gave their own suggestions, theories, and corrections. You all in particular played a huge part in my research and work on this series. I may come back to Petscop. There's always going to be more to talk about, of course. Once you start digging, you never seem to find the end of the hole. But for now, this is where I'll end it, and we can move on to other things in the meantime. But rest assured, every comment you leave, I will be reading. Every theory you put forward, I will see it. I hope you enjoyed this series as much as I enjoyed making it. And keep looking into Petscop. We can investigate together. Thanks for watching today's Panopticon Theatre performance. What do you think? Did I miss anything? What do you want me to talk about next? Make sure to sub and join the audience if you want to see more.